People may have heard of the renowned adventures of Daniel O'Rourke, but few are there who know that the cause of all his perils, above and below, was neither more nor less than his having slept under the walls of the Pugas Tower. I knew the man well. He lived at the bottom of Hungry Hill, just at the right side of the road as you go towards Bantry. An old man he was at the time he told me the story, with grey hair and red nose, and it was on the 25th of June, 1813, that I heard it from his own lips as he sat smoking his pipe under the old poplar tree, on as fine an evening as ever shone from the sky. I was going to visit the caves in Dursey Island, having spent the morning in Glengareth. More for Nax to tell it, sir, said he, so that this is not the first time. The master's son, you see, had come from beyond foreign parts in France and Spain, as young gentlemen used to go before Bonaparte or any such was heard of. And sure enough, there was a dinner given to all the people on the ground, gentle and simple, high and low, rich and poor. Ah, the old gentleman were the gentleman, after all, save in your honour's presence. They'd swear at a body a little, to be sure, and eh, maybe give one a cut of the whip every now and then, but were no losers by it in the end. And they were so easy and civil, and kept such rattling houses and thousands of welcomes. Ah, and there was no grinding for rent, and there was hardly a tenant on the estate that did not taste of his landlord's bounty often and often in a year. Ah, but now it's another thing. Ah, no matter for that, sir, I'd better be telling you my story. Well, we had everything of the best, plenty of it, and we ate, and we drank, and we danced, and the young master, by the same token, danced with Peggy Berry from the Boring. Ah, lovely young couple they were, although they're both low enough now. And to make a long story short, I got, as a body may say, the same thing as tipsy, almost. For I can't remember ever at all, no ways how it was I left the place, only I did leave it, that's certain. Well, I thought for all that in myself, I just stepped to Molly Cronahan, the fairy woman, to speak about a word about the uh, bracket heifer that was bewitched. And so, as I was crossing by the stepping stones of the ford of Ballyshinoch, and I was looking up at the stars and blessing myself for why it was Lady Day, I missed my foot and so I fell into the river. Death alive, I thought, I'll be drowned now. However, I began to swim in, swim in, swim in away for dear life, till at last I got to shore somehow or other, but never one of me can tell of how, upon a dissolute island, I wandered and wandered about there, without knowing where I wandered, until at last I got into a big bog. The moon was shining as bright as day, or your fair lady's eyes, sir, with your pardon for mentioning her, and I looked east and west, north and south, and every way I could, Nothing did I see but bog, bog, bog. I could never find out how I got into it, and my heart grew cold with fear, for sure and certain I was that it would be my barren place. So I sat down upon a stone, which, as good luck would have it, was close by me, and I began to scratch my head and sing the Uligan. When all of a sudden the moon grew black, and I looked up and saw something for all the world as if it was moving down between me and it, and I could not tell what it was. Down it came with a pounce and looked me full in the face. And what was it but an eagle, as fine a one as ever flew from the kingdom of Kerry. So he looked me in the face and he says to me, Daniel O'Rourke, says he, how do you do? Very well, I thank you, sir, says I. I hope you're well, wandering out of my senses the whole time, how an eagle came to speak like a Christian. What brings you here, Don, says he. Nothing at all, sir, says I, only I wish I was safe home again. Is it out of the island you want to go, Dan? says he. Tis, sir, says I. So I up and told him how I had taken a drop too much and fell into the water and how I swam to the island and how I got into the bog and how I did not know my way out of it. Dan, says he, after a moment's thought, though it is very improper of you to get drunk on a lady day, yet as you are a decent sober man who tends mass well and never flings stones at me or mine nor cries out after one in the field, my life for yours, says he. So get up on my back and grip me well for fear you'd fall off and I'll fly you out of the bog. I am afraid, says I, that your honour's making game of me, for who ever heard of riding a horseback on an eagle before? Upon the honour of a gentleman, says he, putting his right foot upon his breast, I am quite in earnest, and so now either take my offer or starve in the bog. Besides, I see that your way to sink in the stone. It was true enough, as he said, for I found that a stone every minute going out from under me. I had no choice, so I think to myself, faint heart never won fair lady, and this is fair persuadance. 
I thank your honour, says I, for the loan of your civility, and I'll take your kind offer. I therefore mounted on the back of the eagle and held him tight enough by the throat, and up he flew in the air like a lark. Little I knew the trick he was going to serve me. Up, up, God knows how far he flew. Why then, I said to him, thinking he did not know the right road home, very civilly, because why, I was in his power entirely. Sir, says I, please your honour's glory, and with humble submission to your better judgment, if you'd fly down a bit, we're just now over my cabin, and I could be put down there in many thanks to your worship. Ah, Dan, says he, do you think me a fool? Look down in the next field, and don't you see two men and a gun? By my word, would be no joke to shoot this way, to oblige a drunken blackguard that I picked up off the cold stone in a bog. Bother you, says I to myself, but I did not speak out, for where was the use? Well, sir, up he kept flying, flying, and I asking him every minute to fly down, and all to no use. Where in the world are you going, sir, says I to him. Hold your tongue, Dan, says he, and mind your own business, and don't be interfering with the business of other people. Faith, this is my business, I think, says I. Be quiet, Dan, says he, so I said no more. At last, where should we come to but to the moon itself? Now, you can't see it from this, but there is, or there was in my time, a reaping hook sticking out to the side of the moon. Dan, says the eagle, I'm tired with this long fly. I had no notion to so far. And my lord, sir, says I, who in the world asked you to fly so far? Was it I? Did I not beg and pray and beseech you to stop an hour ago? There is no use talking, Dan, said he. I'm tired enough, and so you must get off and sit on the moon until I rest myself. Is it sit down on the moon, said I? Is it upon that little round thing there? Why then, sure, I'd fall off in a minute and be killed and spilt and smashed all to bits. You are a vile deceiver, so you are. Not at all, Dan, says he. You can catch fast hold of the reaping hook that's sticking out of the side of the moon, and will keep you up. I won't then, said I. Maybe not, said he, then grew very quiet. If you don't, my man, I shall just give you a shake, and one slap of my wing, and send you down to the ground, where every bone in your body will be smashed as small as a drop of dew on a cabbage leaf in the morning. Why then, I'm in a fine way, said I to myself, ever to have come along with the likes of you. And so giving him a hearty curse, in Irish, for fear he'd know what I said, I got off his back with a heavy heart, took hold of the reaping hook, and sat down upon the moon, and mighty cold seat it was, I can tell you that. When he had me there fairly landed, he turned about on me and said, Good morning to you, Daniel O'Rourke, said he. I think I've nicked you fairly now. You rubbed my nest last year. Twas true enough for him, but how he found out about it is hard enough to say. And in return, you are freely welcome to cool your heels dangling upon the moon like a cockthrow. Is that all, and is that how you serve me, you brute, you, says I? You unnatural beast, and is this the way you serve me at last? Bad luck to yourself with your hooked nose and all your breed, you blackguard. Twas all to no manner of use. He spread out his great big wings, burst out a laughing, and flew away like lightning. I bawled after him to stop, but I might have called and bawled forever without his minding me. Away he went, and never I saw him from that day to this sorrow fly away with him. You may be sure I was in a disconsolate condition and kept up roaring out for the bare grief when all at once, a door opened right in the middle of the moon, creaking on its hinges as if it had not been opened for a month before. I suppose I never thought of greasing them. And out there walks, well, who do you think but the man in the moon himself? Good morrow to you, Daniel O'Rourke, says he. How do you do? Very well, thank your honour, says I. I hope your honour's well. What brought you here, Dan, said he. So I told him how I was a little overtaken in liquor at the master's, and how I was cast upon a dissolute island, and how I lost my way in the bog, and a thief of an eagle promised to fly me out of it, and how instead of that he had flown me up to the moon. Dan, said the man in the moon, taking a pinch of snuff when I was done, you must not stay here. Indeed, sir, says I. Tis much against my will that I'm here at all, but how am I to go back? That's your business, said he. Dan, mine is to tell you that you must not stay, so be off in less than no time. I'm doing no harm, said I, only holding on hard by the reaping hook lest I fall off. That's what you must not do, Dan, says he. Pray, sir, says I, may I ask how many you are in the family that you could not give a poor traveller lodging? I'm sure it is not often that you're troubled with strangers coming to see you, for tis a long way. I'm by myself, Dan, says he, but you'd better let go of the reaping hook. Faith and with your leave, says I, I'll not let go of the grip, and the more that you bids me, the more I won't let go, so I will. You had better, Dan, says he again. 
Why then, my little fellow, says I, taking the whole weight of him with my eye from head to foot, there are two words of that bargain, and I'll not budge. You may, if you like. We'll see how that is to be, says he, and back he went, giving the door such a great bang after him, for it was plain he was huffed, that I thought the moon and all would fall down with it. Well, I was preparing to try strength with him when back he comes with the kitchen cleaver in his hand, and without saying a word, he gives two bangs to the handle of the reaping hook that was holding me up, and what? It came in two. Good morning to you, Dan, said the spiteful little blackguard when he saw me cleanly falling down with a bit of handle in my hand. I thank you for your visit, and fair weather after you, Daniel. I had no time to make any answer to him, because I was tumbling over and over and rolling and rolling at the rate of a fox hunt. God help me, says I, but this is a pretty pickle for a decent man to be seen in at this time of night. I am now sold fairly. The word was not out of my mouth when whiz! What should fly by close to my ear but a flock of wild geese all the way from my own bog of Ballyshanock? How else should they know me? The old gander, who was a general, turning about his head, cried out to me, Is that you, Dan? The same, said I, not a bit daunted now at what he said, for I was by this time used to all kinds of bedevilment, and besides, I knew him of old. Good morrow to you, says he. Daniel O'Rourke, how are you in health this morning? Very well, sir, says I, thank you kindly, drawing my breath, for I was mightily in want of it some. I hope your honour's the same. I think tis fallen you are, Daniel, says he. You may say that, sir, says I. And where are you going all the way so fast, said the gander. So I told him how I had taken a drop and how I had come to the island and how I had lost my way in the bog and how the thief of an eagle flew me up to the moon and how the man in the moon turned me out. Dan, says he, I'll save you. Put out your hand and catch me by the leg and I'll fly you home. Sweet is your hand in a pitcher of honey, my jewel, says I. Though all the time I thought within myself that I don't much trust you, but there was no help. So I caught the gander by the leg, and away I and all the other geese flew after him as fast as hops. We flew, and we flew, and we flew, until we came right out over the wide ocean. I knew it well, for I saw Cape Clear to my right hand sticking up out of the water. At uh, my lord, said I to the goose, for I thought it best to keep a civil tongue in my head anyway. Fly to land, if you please. Uh, it is impossible, you see, Dan, said he, for a while, because, you see, we are going to Arabia. To Arabia, said I. That's surely some place in foreign parts far away. Ah, oh, Mr. Goose, why then, to be sure, I'm a man to be pitied among you. Whist, whist, you fool, said he. Hold your tongue. I tell you, Arabia is a very decent sort of place, as like West Carberry as one egg is like to another, only there is a little more sand there. Just as we were talking, a ship hove into sight, sailing so beautiful before the wind. Ah, then, sir, said I. Will you drop me on the ship, if you please? Now, we are not fair over it, said he. If I dropped you now, you would go splash into the sea. I would not, says I. I know better than that, for it is just clean under us, so let me drop now at once. If you must, you must, said he. There, take your own way. And he opened his claw, and faith, he was right. Sure enough, I came down plump into the very bottom of the salt sea. Down to the very bottom I went, but I gave myself up then and forever when a whale walked up to me, scratching himself after his night's sleep, and looked me full in the face, and never a word did he say, but lifting up his tail, he splashed me all over with cold salt water till there wasn't a dry stitch upon my whole carcass. And I heard somebody saying, there's a voice I knew too, Get up, you drunken brute, off of that! And with that, I woke up, and there was Judy with a tub full of water which was splashing all over me for... Ah, uh, rest her soul, though she was a good wife, she could never bear to see me in drink and had a bitter hand of her own. Get up, she said again, and of all the places in the parish would no place sarve you turn to lie down upon but under the old walls of Carrigabooga. An uneasy resting, I'm sure you had of it. And sure enough I had, for I was fairly bothered out of my senses with eagles and men to the moon and flying ganders and whales driving me through bogs and up to the moon and down to the bottom of the green ocean. If I was ten times drunk over, long would it be before I'd lie down in the same spot again, I know that.